fans in the building today from last year's Utah, uh, Las Vegas Bowl for the college football season. Didn't, let's just pretend that didn't happen. But uh, anyways, I'm uh, Cameron Radke. I'm a first year master's student in the Industrial Hygiene Master's Program at Colorado State University. And I'm Rebecca Foose. I'm a first year master's student in the ergonomics program at CSU. And for the information we're going to pre present to you today, um, it's with a, a project associated with the Mountain and Plains ERC. Um, as a requirement of being a part of that ERC, um, students team up in groups and are partnered with uh, community bit local businesses and industries to help them with health and safety related issues that they may have. Um, let's see. There we go. So we were partnered with a small furniture restoration company located in Fort Collins. Um, this is a small company with six employees. So I mean, as a health and safety professional, our, all our goals are to send workers who are fathers, mothers, daughters, sisters, brothers, send them home at the end of the day just like they came into work. And that's basically what we were trying to do here with these guys, identify the hazards in their workplace, um, what are they concerned about, how we can help. So basically, what these guys do, they're masters at their craft with woodworking, furniture restoration. Um, they get these old pieces of furniture and they restore them to look brand new where they can rough them up a little bit determined on what the customer wants. Um, some of their products, they even go on the, the show Antique Roadshow. I mean, they do some really amazing stuff. So they do refinishing, touch-ups, structural repair. And one of the main areas of concern that we looked at was uh, stripping using the solvent methylene chloride. And on average, they do this work about one to two hours per day. And the product that they use that contains methylene chloride contains about 70 to 80% methylene chloride. So basically, what they have in their little shop, they have a separate. Um, it gets kind of gunked up. The methylene chloride gets everywhere. Um, they have buckets of it laying around and the paintbrush or the brush there is what they used to scrub with the furniture. So that's what it looks like when we first <coughs> entered the site. So why do, why do we care about methylene chloride? What's so bad about it? I mean, it's, it's a great product. The industry likes it. It works really well. Um, it's really efficient, but just like a lot of good things in industry, it's not necessarily the best for your health. Um, it's pretty nasty stuff. It can cause, it's a carcinogen. It affects the central nervous system, liver, kidneys. Um, it affects the body's ability to uptake oxygen. And it, when you're exposed to it, a buildup of carbon monoxide in the blood occurs. Um, it's also an irritant. So right now, they're using, like as the standard um, requires, they're using supplied air respirators when they're working with the methylene chloride. And I mean, that's, they were doing a good job with that, but the standard is pretty lengthy standard with regarding methylene chloride, all, all the monitoring and biological monitoring they need to do. So we kind of came in and tried to help to educa educate them on what else they need to do to further protect themselves. So th the first step when we arrived, we wanted to see what their exposure actually was working with this stuff on a daily basis from one to two hours. So we decided to do um, some short-term exposure monitoring. Um, we did four 15-minute samples. Um, on the particular day we came in, they were only using the methylene chloride for about an hour, so that worked out pretty well. Um, we used the NIOSH analytical method 1005. Um, that states we use a low-flow um, air sampling pump with or orbosive charcoal tubing. So we hook up, there's a picture of me right there hooking up the pump onto his hip and then we use a tube and we wrap around his back and we put the media in his breathing zone to represent what he's actually, what he's breathing in if he wasn't using PPE. So we went ahead and took those samples and we sent those off to the Wisconsin Occupational Health Lab and we got our results back. Um, they were rather high. The short term exposure limit is 125 parts per million and as you can see all of, all each sample was well over that. Um, you can see how it wax and waxes and wanes. Um, the first sample was when he was act actively stripping, and then they move over to the rinsing area, and they rinse it off. 
rinse off the product, and then the third sample is when he goes back to the stripping area and, and s begins stripping again, and the fourth one is the rinsing cycle again, so you can kind of see how it fluctuates depending on the task that he's doing. And then, ex assuming no exposure for the rest of the day, you can calculate the eight-hour time-weighted average, so of 48 parts per million, and then the OSHA PEL, the permissional exposure limit is 25 parts per million, so 48 is well over that as well. So, and it's well over the action limit also. So we kind of have a visual here explaining the really tall one is the short-term exposure limit in red, and then the second red one is the, the time-weighted average, the eight-hour time-weighted average that they were exposed to. So basically what they have here, they have a ventilation system in place that it may or may not be performing as it's designed. So we kind of want to balance out the ventilation and the engineering controls with their exposures, because right now they have pretty l lousy ventilation, so it's really low, and then really high exposure, because we really want to kind of balance that out right now. So. Okay. So just a little bit about our ventilation measurements that we took. Um, the picture of the stripping area, as you can see, has some little red asterisks on it, and that represents the different sampling areas that we measured. Um, we did sampling throughout the stripping room, but for this booth specifically, it was every three feet at both waist height and um, shoulder height, breathing zone height, uh, to get an accurate representation of what those flow, what the air velocity measures were within the space. Um, and that's just a picture of the velocimeter that we used. And these are kind of the results that we came up with. Their average base velocity is 54 um, feet per minute, and that is compared to the acceptable value of 100. Um, so it's pretty low. Well. Their ventilation system is definitely out of date and needs to be upgraded. Um, their current ventilation system, the main reason why it's so low is they have a small size fan. It should be upgraded. Um, currently it's 15 inches, and it needs to be more like 24. We did do a ventilation survey um, as a different class project that gave us those specs. And so they did all of the calculations and that's what they're coming up with. They need a higher horsepower fan. Currently they're less than one horsepower. More like four horsepower would be good and a bigger fan size. Um, there's also a methylene chloride buildup in the plenum or the chimney that takes all of that exhaust out of the building. They need to start cleaning that regularly because as you can see in the previous pictures, it's kind of everywhere. Um, some other intervention strategies that we proposed to them, they incorporated a couple that we have proposed in the past, such as the ventilation slots in the back of that stripping area that suck the air out. Um, before that, it was just a solid wall, which wasn't really doing anything for airflow. Uh, but another thing that we have asked them to incorporate is a front slot that will help uh, eliminate any negative pressure buildup that's happening in front of larger objects and create a downdraft in the front of the worker, so there's not a bunch of methylene chloride collecting right in front of them. Uh, as far as recycling goes, they do reuse their methylene chloride. It probably gets, actually I don't know how many uses, but I would assume about three to four. It kind of varies on what they've been using it for, um, because methylene chloride will take off anything from like a really, really, really strong veneer to stains to paints, really anything. Um, but their current recycling mechanism is simply to collect it, as you can see in the bucket that's next to the stripping area. Just to collect it, open air, not a closed system. They strain it through a large mesh sieve, but that's about it. They're not doing any sort of filtration. And then they just take that drum and they pour it back into the mother drum. And so they're actually diluting their methylene chloride drum, the 55 gallon drum, with essentially polluted methylene chloride. So it's losing a lot of efficacy. So. In terms of ergonomic interventions, we also proposed a couple things for the stripping room in particular. Um, they have the stripping table, as you can see, and then right next to it, so to your right, is the rinsing table. And those two are separated by about a foot. And we proposed to them that they could couple those tables, push them together, take away that baffle, which is necessary for ventilation, but instead make it like a weighted curtain that they could slide backwards, um, and then potentially install a swing lift that could help them transfer items from the stripping area to the rinsing area. They could do it with one person, which is important because currently they only have one supplied airline. 
So right now with any larger pieces, they're actually having somebody go in um, and have to help move those pieces without the appropriate PPE of the fighter. In terms of exposure monitoring, OSHA does require that if you are working with methylene chloride, you determine if your employees are being excessively exposed. If you're above the 12.5 action limit, you have to do continuous exposure monitoring. Um, that includes biological surveillance, such as carboxyhemoglobin measures on tests that your OCMED physician might recommend, um, liver function tests and cholesterol level tests, with other things kind of depending on a case-by-case -case scenario and what your physician decides. Um, but those measures have not been in place for them for at least the last eight years. We're not sure before then if they ever were completely up to date in those specs. Um, another thing that they have done for us, which is good, is they installed an inline flow meter. It's essentially just a flow meter in their supplied air line that calculates the cubic feet per minute that they're getting into their hoods. Um, it was at 5.6. It's supposed to be between 5 and 10 in order to ensure that that positive pressure system within their hood is giving them clean air to breathe. We are going to do some further testing just to make sure that the air in their hood is not getting any uh, methylene chloride exposure, but it shouldn't be at that level, at that flow rate. Um, another thing is that they are required to do quarterly monitoring, such as we did for them. Um, one time a year, they're supposed to come in and do the full uh, testing where somebody who is qualified can come in with a carbo sieve and collect you know, at least four cell samples and figure out what their exposure levels are. And then the other three times a year, they can just use a little badge that they send in for analysis. So the recommendations in summary, um, they're moving to a new facility. So that's actually perfect timing for us. We're moving in about two months. And so they're going to be able to build this, or this dripping room from scratch and the ventilation system from scratch and get everything up to date. Uh, so they're working on that. We've given them specs. This is a picture of one of the specs from the ventilation paper that we gave them. Uh, they've done some of this, as in the back slots they've built in already, but again, they need to install that front slot, and they need to incorporate a recycling system, which they're interested in doing, buying an industrial recycling system for their methylene chloride, um, and also hopefully they'll couple those two tables to make it a little bit more user-friendly. Um, and then biological surveillance, they just need to come up to date on that. Um, that's required by OSHA. There is no reason why they shouldn't be doing it. They just were unaware that they should be doing it. So we told them that they need to go in. Um, we recommended an OCMED physician that's local uh, that can kind of establish a baseline for them and get them up to date on those records, uh, which they're supposed to maintain for 30 years past termination of each employee. So hopefully they'll do that soon. And then we'd just like to thank Dr. Bloswick and the University of Utah, and thanks for having us here today. Any questions? Okay. With all the hassle they're doing and the expense of using methylene chloride, have you looked at substitution, acetone, interference, yeah. something like that? Um, in industry, there's been a lot of effort in that direction, but there's really nothing that is as fast. They can yeah. literally put it on 15 minutes later, take off all of the paint, all of the veneer. Nothing else works that quickly. Other, other things take a period of hours. Um, so really, for their purposes, and any, it's heavily used in other industries as well, any industry prefers to use methylene chloride. But it is very costly. In the EU, actually, it's not even available for consumer use. Um, they'll allow it for industrial use, but it's been outlawed for general consumers. I'm just curious, what, what is this re, uh, the commercial recycling process? I mean, they spin it down as a filter? Or? I think it's a filtration process. Um, there's no real way to recover what's already been used in terms of you know eating out that veneer or paint or whatever it was right. that has essentially quenched that methylene chloride and it's no longer utilizable. But if you can filter out any of those particulates, filter out anything that has been made in there, then you can recycle. <coughs> Yeah. But like right now, they just, all of the large, larger particulates that are suspended in the methylene chloride are going directly back into their system. So, it's good. Yep. Just looking at your reflection as the very baseline, um, just thinking that it's useful information, but would you want to also collect some more of that information with, you know, inside the person with that foot? the force foundation system to see if that 
PPE is actually worth doing that. Yeah, and we're actually planning on doing that before the end of the semester, um, just to ensure that they're being protected. There are a couple things that kind of get in the way when you try to go under a forced air hood, um, because you're forcing air into that hood at 5.6 cubic feet per minute. It's hard to get an accurate sampling from your pump, um, because it's kind of forcing air into the pump. But we're going to try, just because we'd like to know. So. <laughs> It's preemptive. Uh, they actually contacted CSU about OSHA consultation. He has um, several OSHA consult, consult, consultants <laughs> in our facility. Um, and so they reached out after a transfer of ownership. Eight years ago, they were working with OSHA, OSHA consultation and did a lot of intervention, um, but then kind of disappeared and changed owners. So they're trying to bring it back up to standard. So. Yeah. I mean, they have somebody come in and take their used methylene chloride drums. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But beyond that, I don't think they are. So. I just have a clarification. So the Colorado consultation group uh, is run, the OSHA, Colorado OSHA is run through CSU then, is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. on okay. campus there's CSU has an OSHA you know, A lot of states do it through universities like that. Utah hasn't done that. Yeah. We, we work pretty closely with them actually. That's like a great Virginia's resource then. Right now. We have to go out with them. So. Yeah. All right, well let's thank our speakers.